Saya Dr. Nurul Ashikin Alias, uh, selaku fellow penyelidik di Ungku Aziz Center, University Malaya. Hari ini saya telah diberikan kepercayaan untuk melaksanakan ucapan uh, pembukaan bagi program syarahan umum kita pada pagi ini. So, saya welcome everyone yang participate event kita pada pagi ini, uh, iaitu uh, syarahan umum kita buat kali pertama uh, bagi tahun 2024. Uh, dan pada hari ini kita akan mendengarkan satu presentation yang I think quite interesting topic uh, yang uh, tajuk syarahannya adalah bertajuk Economic Hubs for Biomass Potential Game Changer yang akan disampaikan oleh uh, Profesor Datuk Dr. Ahmad bin Ibrahim yang juga merupakan salah seorang Profesor dalam kejuruteraan kimia di UCSI University. So sebelum saya serahkan uh, event kita pada pagi ini kepada moderator kita, izinkan saya untuk memperkenalkan our moderator for today, uh, which is also my colleague previously, so Dr. Romi Bahti, uh, Bahti Hartato yang merupakan senior lecturer di Jabatan Ekonomi, Faculty Ekonomi dan Business di Universitas Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta, Indonesia. So bidang kepakaran beliau uh, adalah berkaitan dengan, uh, uh, no, dia orang berdia, uh, Dr. Romi punya kelulusan uh, ijazah sarjana previously adalah dari dalam bidang ekonomik di Universitas Gajah Mada pada tahun 2012 dan beliau juga mempunyai master dalam ekonomik di Macquarie University Sydney, Australia pada tahun 2015 dan PhD Dr. Pasafah beliau adalah daripada Harriet Ward University uh, dalam kajian yang bertajuk Household Decision Making, Empowerment and Risk Attitude di Indonesia pada tahun 2021. Jadi tanpa saya membuangkan masa, kita tak perlu kan? So kita akan teruskan majlis kita dan saya serahkan majlis kita kepada Dr. Haru uh, Romi untuk moderate. Dipersilakan Dr. Romi. Okey, baik. Terima kasih Dr. Sikin atas uh, perkenalan uh, saya selaku moderator untuk acara ini. Uh, Okey, untuk selanjutnya saya akan memperkenalkan. So, I think I uh, It's better for me to switch uh, the language into English uh, to avoid misunderstanding of what I say if I speak in Bahasa Indonesia. So, uh, I would like to introduce uh, the speaker uh, of this uh, public uh, lecture series uh, at uh, UAC. So, uh, introducing Professor Datu Dr. Ahmad Ibrahim. Uh, he is a professor of chemical engineering at UCSI University. Uh, he is also a director Tan Sri Omar Center for STI Policy Studies. Uh, there is a short bio data uh, of him as the distinguished speaker for this event. So, uh, Professor uh, Ahmad Ibrahim uh, has spent 30 years in the rubber and pulp industry. Uh, I am Porim and MPOC, covering R&D and technical marketing. He's, he is passionate about the issues on sustainability and the plights of small farmer. He also has served in various capacities at CIRIM, ASM, MY, TPM, and MAS. Uh, he also worked as a senior advisor to Germany's Fraunhofer Applied R&D Network. A fellow of the Academy of Science Malaysia, Asian Academy of Engineering and Technology, and also of the International Rubber Research and Development Board. Now he is leading the newly established Tamsi Omar Center for STI Policy Studies at UCSI University. He actively contributes to media writings and columns on science, sustainability, our anti economy, and more in the NSP and STAR. So without any further ado, uh, Our distinguished speaker, Professor Ahmad Ibrahim, uh, would give us an uh, interesting talk about economic hubs to incentivize ways to wealth business can be game changer. So please, uh, Professor Ahmad Ibrahim, the time is yours. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Romi. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and very good morning to everyone who is attending this talk. And I would like to thank the Nko Aziz Center for Development Studies for giving me this opportunity to speak on this very important topic for me about uh, how we can uh, 
utilize or exploit the big biomass quantities that we have in the country to create economic wealth, to create jobs. So my uh, talk today is to share with you an idea about creating these economic hubs for biomass. Uh, and I believe this can be the game changer for the biomass uh, discussion. Next slide, please. So uh, this is the agenda for today. I'll first talk about the palm oil industry itself and how it has been uh, performing over the years and how palm oil actually is a very major industry for Malaysia. And the biomass that it produces is still largely untapped and how Malaysia can actually exploit this vast resource to drive some new economic path for the country. And uh, I will also talk about the economic value of the biomass and the many types of biomass from the, uh, not just from palm oil, there are also biomass from uh, other sectors, especially the municipal solid waste and uh, other uh, agricultural residues. And then I will talk about this idea of creating this biomass hub uh, because we need to properly structure this uh, industry if we are to really benefit from this resource. And then I will conclude. Next slide. Yes, uh, palm oil is always, uh, for many years, have been a very important uh, commodity economy uh, for Malaysia and now uh, also Indonesia. In fact, Indonesia is bigger than Malaysia now in terms of production because they have more land. We have reached the limit in terms of land size, uh, just under 6 million hectares. Our production is about 18.5 uh, million uh, tons. And uh, FFB is a fresh fruit bunch, uh, is about 15 uh, tons uh, per hectare. And we can see from this slide uh, the oil extraction rate, and uh, we also import some palm oil because we have a thriving uh, processing, uh, refining industry in Malaysia. And the palm oil price has remained quite attractive in the last uh, two, three years. So this is what has spurred the growth of this industry. Next. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, the planted area, now we have uh, in Peninsular Malaysia about 2.5 million hectares, but I must tell you that even you go by the state, Sarawak is now leading with 1.6 million hectares. And you look at the mills that we have, it's more than 400 mills. These are the mills which process the uh, fresh fruit bunches into the uh, crude palm oil. And Sabah is also big, uh, next after Sarawak. Next slide. You can see from this slide that we have benefited tremendously from the uh, palm oil economy. We are the fifth world largest producer of oils and fats. There are 17 oils and fats in the world. Of course, palm oil now dominates. We are the fifth world largest. The others are, of course, Indonesia, we have Brazil, Argentina, uh, these are the major producers. And we account for eight, only 8% 8 of uh, total goal, uh, oils, global oils and fats. And we are the second largest exporter uh, because palm oil now dominates the trade, the international trade in oils and fats. Indonesia is the uh, uh, largest exporter. We are second. And if you look at the... Uh, uh, in terms of export of Malaysian palm oil, we are 15.6% of total oils and fats export. And in terms of palm oil trade, we are close to 30%. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, the oils and fats uh, uh, situation in the world, you can see that palm oil accounts for a big chunk we were not like that before, 
uh, those days it was soybean oil was dominating but through the efforts of Malaysia and Indonesia we have become the the largest in terms of uh, contribution to the oils and fats. You can see the other oil as soya bean, sunflower and rapeseed oil. These are the major oils that dominate uh, the world market for oils and fats and production uh, is 250 over million tons and export is close to 100 million tons. Next slide. And these are the major palm oil producers and exporters. Of course, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia uh, dominate the production. And in terms of uh, exports, exporters, we also dominate. There are many others like uh, uh, Colombia uh, and some parts of Africa, West Africa, Thailand also. But uh, we can say that almost uh, more than 85% is Malaysia, Indonesia. Next slide. And consuming countries, of course, consumption is very much related to, uh, uh, to the population. And uh, you see, Indonesia, although it's a big exporter, is also a big consumer of palm oil. Malaysia is number five, but the other big markets or big users of palm oil are India, EU and China. So India, in fact, is 12%. Uh, Next. So in terms of planted area, we have a, a mix of uh, uh, planters here. Uh, smallholders, we have independent smallholders, organized smallholders, we have uh, uh, private uh, estates, but you can see that is a good blend of uh, private uh, and government estates, 73.5%, uh, and uh, smallholders, independent smallholders is 14.5%. I think this is a very good mix because if you have almost 100% smallholders, then it's not going to be uh, uh, very healthy for the growth of the industry. So that's why I think palm oil now has achieved this right mix of small farmers and big plantation. Next. And these are the processing sectors. This is where, this is actually uh, the biggest source of the biomass. And palm oil mills, we have about 446. We have kernel crushing plants. This is another thing about palm oil. If you look at, you look at the other oils and fats, each crop will only produce one kind of oil. But palm, oil palm, we produce two kinds. One is kernel oil and the other one is palm oil. So that's why we have a kernel crushing plants. And we also have a downstream refineries, oleochemical, and also biodiesel plants. Uh, uh, our foray into the energy market has been through biodiesel. In fact, Malaysia, started uh, the whole thing in terms of uh, blending uh, palm biodiesel with uh, uh, petrol biodiesel. Uh, but now Indonesia is ahead of Malaysia in terms of the blend ratio. I think Indonesia is already moving towards 40%. And, and I'm told that Indonesia plan to have 100% uh, uh, palm-based biodiesel for their transport sector. And this is a, a very interesting development for the industry. Next slide. Uh, there is uh, an observation of a decreasing trend of productivity. And there are many uh, factors contributing to this. Uh, one very important factor is labor. Uh, labor scarcity, I was told that during the uh, recent years, many hectares of land, especially in Malaysia, have not been harvested uh, because of lack of labor. And of course, the labor is mainly imported labor. We used to have many uh, labor from Indonesia, but now Indonesia is growing its own oil palm business. So uh, we don't have many coming from Indonesia. We have to look at other. So labor is a big issue 
for the palm oil uh, industry. And uh, other factors include the age or you know, time for replanting. They're not replanted soon enough. Uh, application of fertilizer and also the climate change, weather variables. Uh, at present, there is concern about the, the El Nino, which brings drought to this part of the world. And that's why when you talk about productivity, there is now much talk about investing in uh, technology, especially the current internet AI technology uh, to run the uh, mechanization of the oil palm, especially the harvesting. Next slide. So the outlook, this actually came from, uh, from MPOB. Uh, the outlook for 2024 uh, says that the production is not going to be very much more, 18.75 million tonne, just slightly above uh, 2023. Palm oil exports will jump by 3.3%. And the stocks is expected to go down by 14.8%. So uh, down in palm oil store is good news for price. So we hope the price will uh, be supported in 2024. And the export revenue is massive. Uh, in fact, uh, Malaysia palm oil industry gives about 110 billion a year in terms of export revenue to the country. And this is going up uh, for 2024 by almost 5%. Next. Now, oil palm biomass. This is our topic today. And uh, although biomass uh, is a very important potential economic resource, the bulk of the biomass in Malaysia actually comes from the oil palm industry, the palm oil. Next slide. So the oil palm biomass you can see that it can come from the plantation sector, from the processing sector, and uh, of course, oil is also a biomass, but oil is already uh, being uh, harnessed for the economic potential. But we're talking about the other biomass, like frond, oil palm frond, and it's estimated to be about 15 tons per hectare. So imagine if 6 million hectares is about uh, uh, 90 million tons, right? And uh, every time you harvest a bunch, you need to cut a front. Then the other one is the oil palm trunk. And this is about 75 tons per hectare. This is uh, obtained uh, during replanting. Of course, the, uh, the big biomass that has been exploited for oil is a fresh fruit bunch and is about uh, 35 tons per hectare. This is average, right? And all these biomass, they are categorized as lignocellulosic uh, biomass. It's a woody kind of biomass. It's got cellulose, it's got lignin, and this is going to be the materials or the chemicals, uh, the compounds that will be uh, generating the kind of uh, value from uh, the oil palm biomass. And then we have in the milling, in the milling sector, we have the palm kernel. Uh, palm kernel actually comes uh, from the center of uh, the palm, the palm fruit. And, and when you crush the oil palm fruit for oil from the meso cup, then you are left with the palm kernel and palm kernel goes for palm kernel crushing as I mentioned earlier. Then we have the mesocarp fiber. After you have removed the oil, palm oil comes from the mesocarp. Then you are left with the fiber. And oh, the big one is 23% uh, is from empty fruit bunch. Uh, that is actually the target of much of this discussion on the economic hub that we're talking about. Of course, the other biomass is a crude palm oil. It's already being commercialized. So the, <clears throat> the other thing that uh, from palm kernel, you, you can crush it to produce palm kernel oil and palm kernel shell is uh, the other biomass that is still very much untapped. 
and palm kernel cake. Palm kernel cake, uh, uh, it is actually uh, already a business uh, in terms of export to uh, Europe. They're using it for the dairy industry. And the other thing that I want to talk about when talk about biomass is a palm oil meal effluent. And this is rich in many uh, compounds, fertilizers, uh, organic, uh, uh, sludge, and all these will form the basis of what we are to, uh, we'll be talking about, you know, the biomass economy. Next slide. Now, this is uh, what we call, as I mentioned, is a lignocellulosic uh, uh, material. And the constituent, as you can see here, it varies for the different biomass. And uh, it all palm front, we talk about cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin. These are the three major things. And cellulose, of course, is a precursor for sugars. Uh, so these are the potential uh, uh, reaction or potential products that can come from this biomass. So we see that in oil palm front is a very high concentration of cellulose and hemicellulose. So is oil palm trunk. And uh, I'm told that uh, some of these biomass oil palm trunk, they are rich in sugars, which uh, has been uh, researched for production of uh, ethanol, bioethanol. is another uh, important uh, energy or fuel. And then the current interest uh, that is very big now in Malaysia is the empty fruit bunches. Uh, this is where uh, this is produced from all the mills in the country. You see, like oil palm front, it's not very easy to collect because it is uh, in the plantation. Oil palm trunk, you can only collect after each replanting. And then the <clears throat> palm kernel shell is coming from the crushing of uh, kernel and palm kernel cake. Uh, so, so these are the uh, major biomass that are of interest. And uh, I think in terms of practicality, we are looking at the EFB. This is the one that is most easy to collect from the meal. And uh, is also uh, on a daily basis, you can get uh, many quantities of this. Next. Now, uh, currently, uh, the palm oil industry, we also can refer it as having already the uh, biorefinery concept, where the oil palm plantation, uh, the EFB uh, and FFB goes to the palm oil mill, it produces the oil, and then the EFB uh, will go into uh, various options, composting plant, it can go into uh, use of uh, uh, boiler fuel uh, to produce uh, flue gas and energy, electricity, and the uh, palm oil mill effluent, which uh, can produce biogas, is another uh, potential renewable fuel, and biodiesel, of course. So in fact, if in the past, palm oil was only looked at as uh, uh, mainly products, 80% for food and 20% for chemicals, oleochemicals, now we have this energy mix in the palm oil, potential energy mix. Of course, the one that is commercialized is biodiesel, but the other opportunities which have yet to be fully uh, capitalized are in the EFB and, of course, the other uh, biomass. But EFB uh, will be the focus of my idea uh, to create this uh, economic, uh, the biomass economic hub. So there are a lot of potential uh, uh, product uh, from this uh, biorefinery uh, network. Next. So now, if you look at some options of 
adding value to some of these products that uh, is existing, this is where the circular economy comes into the picture. You can see that uh, uh, the oil palm trunk, as I mentioned, is rich in sugars, and this can be developed or converted into ethanol, succinic acid, which is a major uh, chemical used in industry, which can also move towards bioplastics. So this is yet to be fully commercially uh, explored. Then there is uh, animal feed that can come from uh, the kernel expeller. And uh, the other thing that we have not discussed is the algae, the microalgae, which can come from the flue gas and uh, <coughs> of the burning of uh, EFB. Uh, and in fact, we have been talking to some companies from Japan. Japan is very serious about expanding uh, investment in microalgae. In fact, uh, we spoke to one company which is now operating in Sarawak. Their plan is for the next uh, many years, it will be really big in terms of trying to capitalize on algae as a producer of uh, oil, lipids for aviation fuel and other uses. So uh, palm oil has got this potential. And uh, I know in Malaysia, there is also active work on algae, but in terms of full commercialization, we're still far away. So we need to have a properly structured uh, governance structure for the biomass to get it to move, to capitalize, to harness all this uh, potential. And you talk about biogas, it's another uh, very important uh, outcome of the digestion of the palm oil meal effluent. So this can go for electricity. Uh, so the potential is enormous. Next slide. So these are the potential uh, technologies uh, for uh, to get value from bio, uh, the biomass uh, from oil palm. And uh, you see that uh, the, in terms of top 12 value added chemicals from biomass that you can see is pharmaceutical industry uh, can use in food packaging and coatings, uh, polyurethane detergents. So a lot of potential which are yet to be fully uh, commercialized. Next slide. And uh, this is uh, showing uh, the conversion, the bioconversion. Uh, it can be a microorganism using fermentation and also through uh, other non-enzyme uh, process, even uh, through combustion and uh, to in combination of uh, combustion and other chemical uh, and biological reaction, we can produce all these uh, high value products from the oil palm biomass. Next slide. And this is uh, on the biogas, as I mentioned earlier, the palm oil meal effluent. Uh, the recovery of biogas is not only important for economic reason, but one of the issues faced by the palm oil industry is the greenhouse gas emission. And greenhouse gas emission can come uh, not only from, uh, from the processing, but also from the plantation. And in the processing, the main source is methane. Uh, methane in the biogas. You see that biogas is about 65% methane. And if you listen to the recent discussion at COP28, the conference of parties which was held in Dubai, methane has now come under a lot of attention in terms of global warming. And palm oil will have to take steps to uh, reduce emission of methane especially from the biogas, but there are also other sources because methane uh, gets produced when there is a rotting of uh, cellulose, uh, organics. 
So we need to be very careful about uh, the whole uh, process of managing our biomass. And one big concern is a lot of the EFB is sent to landfill. And this is another very important source of uh, methane emission. Uh, so if uh, we do not take steps to reduce uh, this emission, this can uh, lead to a negative image in terms of a greenhouse gas emission uh, from uh, uh, palm oil industry. This is already a problem for the European uh, market. Uh, of course, they look at deforestation as the other one, which also lead to emission. So uh, emission to me is a very important area that the palm oil industry has to look at. Next slide. So in Malaysia, we have actually articulated in many of our plans on how to, to move this biomass agenda forward. We had it mentioned in the 12 Malaysia plan, in the new energy transition roadmap, in the new industrial master plan, and many other development plans, biomass. And recently, the government uh, is a wise move to launch again the biomass action plan. We used to have a biomass strategy many years ago, but our problem in the country is we don't have a proper structure to move this industry forward. So in all these uh, plans, we mentioned that we need to capitalize on EFB as an economic resource. We need to adopt sustainable management practices to achieve this very important net zero uh, a target, and we need to develop a thriving biomass industry. We talk about green economy, and biomass can be a resource that can drive a green economy. And uh, uh, we need to tap on the EFB as bioenergy in terms of energy transition and support research and development for biomass conversion. At the moment, I think research and development is quite scattered. It's not uh, uh, like palm oil. We have a Malaysian palm oil board, which actually uh, focuses on all R&D on palm oil. Uh, but biomass, we have it done in universities, in uh, research institutes. So it's quite scattered. We need to structure this to drive this industry. And of course, we need to attract investments, uh, ultimately, in the biomass business. I'm told that there has been much interest in uh, investment from overseas to try and uh, capitalize on our biomass. But this could not take place because of problems of supply, logistics, and all this will have to be taken care of if we are to truly uh, benefit from this resource. Next slide. Next, yes. So, in terms of EFB, we, we produce more than 20 million tons a year. And this is a big economic potential. And this biomass, if it's not well managed, it can be an environment hazard. As I mentioned, a methane emission uh, will be, uh, will, and the landfill will be overflowing with this. And uh, it's mentioned here, a very big amount is now dumped at landfills or incinerated and discarded in orphan areas. So we are wasting on this biomass. So I think the recent launch of the biomass action plan by the government is a good move, but we need to have a proper structure to drive this industry. And I believe that this biomass-based economy can be an important contributor to the nation's uh, economy. Next. So there are many, uh, one area is of course uh, energy, uh, but it can be used for many other things. Uh, the non-energy uh, GHG emission, if you see from uh, this uh, slide, you see that EFB waste uh, contributed 13%. Uh, which is high, and then other agricultural waste. When you talk about MS, we can also look at other waste from the rice field, from the timber, 
And so if you have a biomass uh, plants, power plant, then they can uh, produce renewable electricity from this. And now uh, the biomass capacity is only for 1% of the AIB produce, which is very low. And many biomass power plants, they face problem because of uneven, uncertain supply of EFB. So we need to look at this and try to smoothen uh, supply of feed material to the biomass uh, industry. Next slide. Next. So in terms of capacity of biomass plants, uh, combined annual uh, number of palm oil mills is about uh, 450 mills. Uh, annual processing capacity is about 120 uh, million tons. The utilization rate and the fresh fruit vines process EFB produced, you see, is about 21 over million tons. And total energy, the power equivalent that you can derive from this uh, is a lot. Next. So biomass hubs, this is the idea that we want to propose uh, to the government. In fact, uh, this has also been mentioned in the biomass action plan. And, but how do we realize this? How do we get this going? Uh, how to create these biomass hubs to be an active player in the biomass-based economy? Next slide. So there are many benefits of these biomass hubs. When you talk about hubs, it's actually uh, creating a center where, because one of the problems with biomass is the, the logistics or to bring together enough quantity uh, that will justify uh, the rationale for an economic scale of uh, processing. So, so benefits, one is of course economic benefits, it creates jobs, there's revenue, but the other very important benefit is environment, reduce the carbon footprint, and, and social benefits, community development, and uh, other aspects of energy independence. Next slide. Uh, yes, uh, I think this is a uh, repeat. Next, next. Now, if you want to have this uh, biomass hub, we need to have proper infrastructure. Uh, for example, transportation networks, storage facilities. And if we can develop this biomass hub to be uh, a viable uh, place for conversion of biomass or EFB into value-added products, then we can link it to the export market. And I'm also thinking of the other infrastructure of technology support. This is where every hub, we're not going to just have one hub. I'm thinking of uh, maybe each of the palm oil rich state will have a hub. Because uh, like uh, Perak, Perra is now looking at uh, a potential hub uh, in the Tulu Intan. Uh, they have enough, but you need to have proper feeding of this uh, EFB into this hub. And for technology support, my suggestion is we must have uh, uh, an R&D uh, lab, a laboratory within the hub. And this can bring partnership from the universities, uh, and other biomass research uh, centers to contribute to this hub. And uh, in this way, we have a complete picture of technology, uh, processing, employment, logistics. So these are the major infrastructure requirements. Next. So this is an example uh, in graphic uh, in terms of uh, the hub. You see, they have a different type of biomass, not just EFB. They can go to this uh, uh, for, uh, for electricity generation. 
and uh, and this can go to the industrial users. But the other thing is that if we have a biomass hub which converts into different products, there are many products now that people are looking at on a small scale, like production of proteins, uh, the black soldier flies, uh, production of fertilizers, and uh, people are also talking about graphite. And uh, we have just discussed about those other things on biogas, sarcinic acid. All this can come in one center through some kind of partnership. And uh, the electricity needed for this can be supplied by the biomass itself. So uh, if we truly have a vibrant uh, hub for biomass, we don't even have to sell it to uh, the grid. And the other thing we must realize is now every company or every business must conform to the ESG, which is a, a conformance of environment, social and governance. And this is becoming more and more uh, important. Uh, in fact, the uh, Bursa Malaysia has made it mandatory for uh, uh, voluntary now, but it will be mandatory for the reporting of your ESG. And ESG will determine uh, future investment also in your business. So companies will have to move towards an ESG-friendly business. So if the electricity is coming direct from the uh, biomass uh, combustion, it is renewable energy. So whereas if you get it from the grid, it can be a mixture of coal-fired, uh, gas-fired. So it's not a completely uh, ESG uh, compliant. Next slide. But very important to make this a success is the government have to support because it involves a lot of uh, regulation, we need to control the, the logistics business, must be properly regulated. And this is the essence of the collection. If the transport business is, uh, doesn't uh, work well, then this cannot lead to a good economic hub. And there are no other policies in terms of disposal of biomass to avoid methane generation, greenhouse gas emission, uh, away from landfill, all these regulations must come in place so that uh, this, uh, uh, only this can make the biomass hub work. Next. So there are challenges to the, uh, this uh, hub that I'm talking about. Uh, the, big, the biggest challenge is, of course, the supply of EFB or the raw materials. And this is where uh, government regulation must come in. We have to organize the uh, logistical operation uh, of, the, uh, of the EFB or other biomass so that uh, we have truly efficient way of uh, moving the biomass to the hub for processing. And uh, uh, the solutions are there because we've done it for the other industry. I always look at the palm oil industry as a very good model. The palm oil industry, if they do not have the structure that we already put in place in terms of plantation, processing, logistics, export, uh, storage, then we will not have the palm oil industry that uh, we have at the moment. So we need to think along those lines. And I have actually written proposing the formation of a, a biomass economy or a biomass development board, just like the Malaysian Palm Oil Board. I think if the government is serious about moving this biomass agenda, they have to really think uh, about uh, giving it a proper structure. Next slide. So in conclusion, biomass is a renewable resource. Biomass has tremendous economic potential. And the uh, EFBs from the palm oil industry, they are available in vast quantities. Even the oil palm fronts, we have to think of how to efficiently collect these fronts. They can be another big source of biomass. 
And uh, there are many studies uh, where it show that AFB biomass can be converted into high value products. We're talking about uh, even products like graphite, graphene. And I'm told that uh, with the development of the EV industry, batteries, they're going to need a lot of uh, those uh, graphites. Uh, logistics, of course, form the biggest, the major challenge. And this is where the government needs to step in to have the proper regulation and governance. But uh, biomass hub, to me, is a very big potential way to harness the vast amounts of biomass that we have in the country. Next slide. So in terms of the way forward, the, uh, the abundant biomass uh, can be a promising feedstock for biorefinery, as we explained earlier. The wastewater from palm oil industry uh, uh, is a suitable source for circular economy. Uh, when you talk about sustainability, one of the main feature of sustainability that is discussed in the world is to move to a circular economy. That means the waste from one industry will be a feed material for another industry. So we need further work to, to look at the techno-economic feasibility of this bioconversion. And uh, this can be done. That's why we need to have the technology and research arm of the hub. And uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, technology integration and resource optimization, they form the key to successful implementation of this bioeconomy. Thank you very much, Dr. Romi. That was my presentation. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Ahmad Ibrahim, uh, for your interesting uh, presentation and topic. Uh, so if there's anyone who would like to post question, uh, you are welcome uh, to ask directly or to uh, invite to uh, or try to type uh, your question in a chat box. So uh, before moving to the question, I would like to provide a summary of the presentations from Professor Ahmad Ibrahim. So efficient organic waste management is crucial for achieving net zero goals. Untreated organic wastes, particularly from agriculture, emit potent greenhouse gases, causing environmental challenges. So converting waste into valuable resources is a business opportunity. While Malaysia grappling with palm oil mill empty food ventures suggests creating economic hubs for waste to wealth ventures. A comprehensive plan involves waste analysis, product identification, technology exploration, and collaboration between industry and research institutions. Regulatory enforcement, structural financing, infrastructure investment, efficient sup uh, supply chains, and public communications are vital. Strengthening collaboration and incentivizing waste to wealth business can lead to a sustainable circular economy, transforming waste into valuable resources with economic and environmental benefits. So that's my little summary. Uh, so I guess there is one question from Jafar Ahmad. So uh, you mentioned about the idea of creating biomass development board similar in line with MPOP. So can you please elaborate more? Which ministry will be responsible to oversee these ideas? Thank you for the question, Jafar Ahmad. So please, Professor Ahmad, uh, uh, you can respond to this question. Oh, can you repeat the question? I didn't quite hear that. Oh, okay. So uh, you mentioned about the idea of creating biomass development board similar in line mm. with MPOP. Mm. So can mm. you please elaborate more? And which ministry will be responsible to oversee this idea? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, actually, uh, Biomass Development Board, my idea is to establish along the lines of the Palm Oil Board, where you have this close collaboration between industry, government, and research. So the, uh, this has worked well, not only for uh, palm oil, for, for rubber at one time it was working very well. Uh, but rubber, the problem is the mix of the production is now uh, very heavily towards uh, small farmers. We need to have a blend of this. 
Now the ministry, the most appropriate ministry, of course, because the bulk of the biomass we're talking about is empty bunches from the palm oil uh, industry. So uh, the biomass action plan is now the is put under the Ministry of Plantation. So the way to start is uh, the Ministry of Plantation will be a good uh, way to start creating this, this board. Uh, but very important I want to mention is we must have industry participation to drive this board, as has happened with uh, palm oil. Uh, because industry participation, the industry understands the business better uh, and they will provide the necessary input to guide the board towards uh, creating a vibrant biomass-based industry. Thank you. Any more okay. questions? <laughs> Somebody is asking online, eh? Yeah, uh, who are interested to ask him, they can just, just speak online and ask uh, Prof Ahmad the mm. question directly. Yeah. But, but Romi, we got another question. Yes, uh, there is one question from mm. Nifakam Sitara. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, thank you very much. The recent COP28 and currently ongoing Davos 2024 of World Economic Forum have close focus on not zero emission and launch funds for loss. How biomass could assist to achieve net zero? Thank you. Oh, you're talking about the World Economic Forum, is it? Mm -hmm. uh, that they are... Uh, prescribing net zero emission and how okay. biomass yes can, uh, well uh, as i mentioned biomass if not properly managed it can be a source of emission the the uh, greenhouse gas emission but if we can manage it properly we remove uh, that uh, emission uh, i mentioned earlier about methane emission for methane is almost 20 times more potent than carbon dioxide in terms of greenhouse gas. And uh, if we can manage this biomass well, we not only uh, achieve or uh, we only achieve the target of net zero, but we also derive the economic value from this biomass. And as I mentioned, this biomass is rich in the basic uh, compounds of uh, cellulose, hemicellulose, and these are actually the building blocks for new uh, uh, product. Uh, as you know, uh, one of the main concern uh, in the sustainability discussion is our resource depleting. We have a depleting resource. Our major materials are depleting. So this can be, uh, this renewable uh, biomass can be another source to replace those depleting uh, resource from the natural uh, system. So it can solve both. It gives economic value and it also solves the emission issue. Yeah. Okay, so very fruitful sharing, Professor. Thank you. So any other questions from the audience that you can ask directly uh, with our own voice? Ah, okay. So there is one question. Uh, it's from Dr. Diana from Sarawak Development Institute. Mm. So she has one question. How can the development of a biomass hub engage and benefit local communities, ensuring social sustainability and support for ways to well initiatives, especially in rural areas? Thank you. Yeah, Sarawak, as I mentioned, is a leading state in terms of palm oil production, oil palm area. But of course, Sarawak is a big country. Uh, logistics, a major challenge there. Uh, but if we talk uh, about uh, converting uh, biomass, uh, EFB and all this into products, there are many ways it can benefit the society. One is, of course, uh, employment. It provides employment. If we can produce 
uh, these products and export on these products. This create a new uh, opportunities for jobs. But the other one is, of course, the environment aspect. Because now, uh, without the proper management of the biomass, many end up in landfill, which is not good for health, for public health, for environment. And it uh, poses a new source of uh, health problems for the community. So, uh, all in all, it is very good. Uh, for the community in terms of properly managing the biomass. And uh, palm oil effluent is another one. This is another uh, a biomass which can pose serious uh, pollution problem if not properly managed and not properly treated. So treatment is a cost. To build treatment plant is a cost. But if you can offset this cost with the biogas that you recover, then this will make it uh, amenable to a commercial operation. Thank you. All right, so it has been answered. Uh, anyone else? Any other questions? Mm, not many questions. We can finish early. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I think so, depending on the MC. <laughs> <laughs> Prof, I got uh, a question for you. I got a question for you. So can I uh, ask yeah, directly? Yeah. Uh, I'm not really familiar with uh, all palm actually. So mm. uh, I got about three questions right now. Whoa. So okay, three, three questions. Question. Yeah, three questions. But the simple one, I think, because, uh, yeah, yeah. because because I'm not even familiar with it. So yeah. uh, I saw in your slide about the the graph about independent small holder and organized mm. small holder. May I know what is the difference between those two? The first one, mm. and then about the okay. Hello, we when we talk about the biodiesel, about the biogas uh, in mm. Malaysia, we we are not really we are not really familiar with it. We are not really even implemented. I think so far. Mm. So, from your opinion, Prof, what do you think about how we should implement it to make it successfully in Malaysia? Because as you said in your presentation. We have so many obstacles in terms of logistics, facilities, mm. uh, mm -hmm. EFB. So from your opinion, how we sh what should we do to implement it successfully in Malaysia? That's my second question. And my third question, when you talk about the biomass energy could be mm. a renewable energy. Yes, we know uh, because uh, when I learned about the renewable energy, biomass is one, one of it. So between right now we are using hydrological energy from the water. So for between biomass energy and hydrological energy, which one is better or else how much the capacity of the biomass energy could be supported the hydrological energy itself in Malaysia? Mm. That's that's just just three questions wow. from me. They're all very tough questions. <laughs> Not <too wrong. laughs> So anyway, the, the smallholders, we have organized smallholders that are like Felda, Felkra. Okay, they're not organized. These are organized. Okay. Independent, they're on their own. Small ah, thing on their own. I yeah. see. So they're That's not so organized. Ah, okay. Uh, now, in terms of the, you mentioned about what, the biogas? Yeah, the, the biodiesel, biogas. You, I saw in your presentation. Ah, yes, so yes, 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 yeah, yeah, I'm thinking, how we could implement it in Malaysia successfully? Yeah, that's why. Right. So what is happening now is that there are many people looking at uh, producing biogas, sell as cooking gas, and yeah, uh, yeah. well structured. There must be a proper structure of uh, market pricing and all this. This is where uh, the, the board uh, has to play that role. Mm -hmm. And uh, because biogas is, uh, is uh, untapped at the moment. And if it is released into the atmosphere, then it creates problem in terms of our carbon target, uh, net zero. Now, I know that uh, we were talking, I mentioned earlier about this company from Japan. Uh -huh. They have a plant, uh, algae plant in Sarawak. And the algae plant taps on carbon from the flue gas of the energy of the power plant. So they said that if 
the palm oil AFB can produce this electricity is enough to power a big plantation of algae plantation. So that is their thinking. So if you compare with hydropower, of course, hydropower uh, is also a very important source of renewable energy. But uh, I want to tell you that uh, you cannot just rely on one source of renewable energy. We cannot mesh uh, the fossil fuel. That's why you have a combination of solar, uh, you have wind, uh, you, have, you have biomass, you have hydro. In fact, now people are also talking about nuclear. Nuclear as another source of uh, energy, which is renewable and no emission. Uh, so these are very interesting. And the last question also, I, I forgot. Yeah, yeah. The, I think the last question you already answered it, Prof. Because uh. I'm comparing between the biomass energy and hydro uh. hydro energy. I think you already answered it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to mention is uh, there was a study done in Vienna huh? by this international uh, institute uh, okay. to look at climate change, how climate change will affect the hydropower. Climate, See, climate change, change affect hydropower. Climate change, when you have climate change, mm -hmm. one of the, yeah, yeah, the water, uh, consequence water of climate change is the rise in temperature of water. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, and this can lead to a reduced volume of water going to hydropower. Mm -hmm. So they are predicting this, and this is a problem we need to be aware of. So that's why we need to look at all options for renewable energy. If we are to replace the fossil fuel, it cannot be just one. It can be, it must be a combination mm -hmm. of these uh, various renewable energy. Mm. Thank you, Prof. Okay, so I guess there is another question mm. uh, from Jafar Ahmad. So thank you, Dato. You mentioned briefly about algae production. How far is Malaysia in achieving commercialization? How much development works are and and investors that we have generated? Ah, this is algae. In fact, to me, algae is another biomass. Uh, whereas the other biomass are residues from agriculture, algae is one that you produce, a biomass that you produce. Uh, in fact, Malaysia, there is research here and there in universities about microalgae and uh, seaweed. These are the algae, various forms of algae, but it's not being properly tapped in the country. And uh, microalgae is a very important source of feed for aquaculture, which we import a lot. So again, it's not well organized, not structured, and the potential is there. I told you about this Japanese company. We talked to them, and their plan is you're going to have millions of hectares of algae uh, uh, plantation uh, all over the world where they're going to tap uh, the oil, the lipids, the oil for making fuel. And one area that is of interest is uh, the sustainable aviation fuel. That is, uh, in fact, I think. Uh, our own Petronas has got a project also with one of the algae companies to look at uh, production from the flue gas from the uh, it's part of the carbon capture in the fossil fuel uh, uh, sort of uh, initiative to reduce emission. And one big carbon capture project is to use algae because algae is a plant, so in photosynthesis they need carbon. They use carbon to grow algae, and then the, the species of algae that can also have a lot of uh, uh, lipids, oil. So these are things that we look at. But Malaysia, that's why uh, if we want to have this biomass board, it's not just uh, oil palm biomass, it's uh, municipal waste uh, and algae. Uh, these are the three to me are the main biomass and other agricultural residues. All right. Okay. So, will there be any question? So, does everyone agree that we should have this board? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah. So, 
uh, we should, uh, you know, provide these inputs. Unko Aziz Centre should provide the input to the government. Oh my we God, every time. <laughs> you know, I always admire Unko Aziz. He always is an academic. He's always out with ideas for the country. You know, economic yeah, yeah, uh, programs. This is what we mm -hmm. want. We want to suggest to the government and then we'll work out what is the best arrangement. I see. So there is one more question. Mm -hmm. I think one other question from uh, Nordiana Abdul Halim. Uh, she is asking about whether there is any success story on this biomass up development that really help to improve waste management. No, no success story. Nobody has done it. So this is uh, an idea that we are proposing if we are truly to harness this massive uh, resource. Otherwise, it will be go on as usual. It will be very fragmented, very disjointed, and the industry will not grow. So this is uh, an experiment that we're trying to introduce, but it's not without this, because it makes a lot of sense uh, in terms of getting the right critical mass of biomass to feed an industry. The problem with waste is that waste are produced all over the place, mm -hmm. but to feed a viable economy, you need to have a certain volume. So this is where uh, the challenge is, and we can't do it uh, the way we do it at the moment. It will not happen. So no, no, nobody has actually uh, used this idea, but it is, uh, to me, it's just like any idea to bring together groups, like uh, when we did like uh, Nko Aziz, one of his greatest idea was uh, Tabung Haji. Tabung Haji, yes. Yeah, he brought people who has a, a, a common mission to contribute funds, and they create... Uh, and of course, fell down. So these are things that uh, we bring together, uh, cooperatives or whatever. Uh, so economic, uh, biomass economic hub is an idea that I think is worth trying. Okay, so is there any question? <laughs> no more questions. Okay, so Dr. Shikin. Yeah. Should 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 I take over it from here right now? I think so. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, uh terima kasih banyak prof uh Dr. Dr. Ahmad. I'm actually I'm very interested with the topic because um Memang, I, kalau dengar tu macam, wow, banyak idea, banyak potential should be come out after this, kan? So, macam, uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you, Dr. Romi. Uh, untuk for the very, uh, very, for, if uh, I, maybe for if it. I can suggest. Uh, yeah, yeah, Prof. Maybe we work together, Nko Aziz and Chan Omar. Why not? We, we are welcome with open hands. research on this. Yeah, why not? Huh? We, why we, not? We, we, we are welcoming you with open hand. Okay, <laughs> Okay, uh, I think another, there okay. remains one question from Joshua Rungo. Oh, another, another question, another Prof. Another question. Yeah, yeah, another question. Another question. So, Prof, uh, can a biomass center be a method in collecting garbage from rural rivers settlement as we are out of from municipal coverage, for example, we are from Song District, so Sungai Rejang is another polluted road by rubbish from Belaga and Kapit. Oh, you're talking about municipal waste, isn't it? rubbish. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it can work. But uh, the thing is, how do you get people to uh, send this uh, uh, waste to the center? It's all about uh, getting a collection center for this waste. And of course, uh, if you, need, you talk about municipal waste, it needs also to be changed in behavior, behavior of people. And this is another topic. In fact, we can. Uh, I have written on this as well. How to get people to change their behavior to separate uh, garbage and all that. Now, I think they're not incentivized. There is no value given to. There's no value. There's no market. So this is why again they need all this structured uh, governance to move people to change behavior 
and to do what is best for them and the environment. Uh, yes. So that's why when I say uh, hub, not just for uh, oil palm, it can be other biomass as well, uh, as mentioned earlier. So we can create a model first for oil palm because it is uh, abundant and also easy to collect uh, from the mills. So we create that as a model and see if it works well, then this can be extended to the other biomass. Okay, so there is a continuing question from the same uh, uh, asker. So uh, he uh, he asked. Uh, yeah. So he said that he always asked his community to do recycle. But yeah. he also said as people keep throwing garbage or other ways to the river, sadly by flood. Yeah, because recycling is a behavioral change. Yeah, Our culture, we're not used to that. You can cannot compare with Japan, all this. So how do we change that behavior? To me, the only way to change the behavior is to cry, to uh, to provide the incentive. Uh, incentive can be creating the market. Like now, if you are selling your uh, uh, discarded besi uh, buruk, uh, we call it. Mm -hmm. It goes to the you know uh, uh, the, the buyer, which is not well, not transparent in terms of the market. What is the price they pay? You know, so we have to create all this. If we want people, okay, plastic. Mm -hmm. If we have plastic waste, where where do I send it? How much do I get for it? You know, if we go to Germany, there are plastic bottles. They have in the, each supermarket. You can go and put your plastic bottle, and you get some credit. You know, so all this uh, mechanism, who who to do to create this? So this is why I think the Ministry of uh, Local Authority and all this and other ministries should come together to move this. Otherwise, you'll be talking about this, uh, you know, separating out the waste forever. It will not happen. Yeah, it has to be proper uh, market for this. All right. Eh, dah dekat pukul 12 dah. Eh? Ha, tu dah dekat pukul 12 dah. <laughs> okay. Tak ada, tak ada question lagi. Ah, uh, so far, Dr. Rumi tak ada lah kan rasanya? No, no question. Hmm. So, I'll just take over, okay? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you to uh, Prof. Ahmad, Dr. Rumi for a very insightful and very informative discussion for today. So, I'm really, really thank you for everyone who still stay with us till the end of our public lecture. And we are really uh, welcoming if you guys can still keep supporting us for our next, 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 and the next our publication uh, for the 2004 and years coming. So uh, before we end our session for today, uh, could everyone please turn off the, eh, turn on, turn on the camera so we could snap the group picture. Boleh tak? Turn on everyone punya camera so kita boleh snap uh, group picture. So staff akan snap after this. Uh, Pali akan ambil alih kah? Pali tolong masuk? Ya, yeah, ya, yeah, Doktor. Ya, yeah, Doktor. Saya. <laughs> okay. Semua orang dah, dah turn on camera eh? So kita akan snap. Uh, Fadli akan count. Sekejap, sekejap. Dah kembali? Dah tak ada yang nak buka dah. Ah uh, semua orang dah buka kamera eh? Ada lagi yang tak buka? Ah uh, Zarina, Noshida, ah uh, anyone tak ada nak buka dah? Okey kan. Kalau tak kita snap je lah. <laughs> Okey, semua dah sedia. Satu, dua, tiga. Lagi sekali kah? Ah, yeah. Sekali lagi. Satu, dua, tiga. Okay, last. Satu, dua, tiga. Okay, terima kasih semua. Okay, selesai our session. So, kita akan jumpa lagi for the next time, okay? 
Prof. Terima kasih banyak ya, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Prof. Okay, Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Take care and have a good day. Yeah, Bye. you too. Take care. Have a good day as well. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.